it is officially June, which means we are due to discuss what was read last month. I read 12 books in the month of May, and so this video is just gonna be simple sit down, sharing of the feelings about each and every book that I read last month. If you can't already tell, I'm a bit under the weather, so I'm just gonna keep this low key, keep it cozy, and just talk about some books. But real fast, I'd like to sit and talk about today's sponsor with you, which is none other than book of the month. Is anyone surprised? I usually like to get really fancy with my ad reads. I love my transitions, I love funky editing, but to stay in the spirit of today's sickly video, we're gonna stick to simple, cozy chats. You probably already know, but Book of the Month is a super popular and ever-growing book service for readers just like me and just like you, I assume, if you're watching this video. Their mission is to promote new and emerging authors to help find readers books that they're bound to love. Their team works night and day, sifting through hundreds of titles to give us a monthly selection of curated new and released hardcover fiction, which means you can spend less time scouring Goodreads and Storygraph and Bookstagram and Booktube and Booktalk trying to figure out what to read next and spend more time within the pages of the story. But my personal favorite part of Book of the Month is that it's risk-free, which means you can push pause on any month for whatever reason whatsoever without being penalized. As long as you have a US-based shipping address, you can get your first book from Book of the Month for $9.99 using the code Allison Pages. Also, new and exciting development has unfolded in the Book of the Month headquarters. They have a virtual book tour podcast. It's hosted by two members of their editorial team. They film it in front of a live studio audience in New York City. They interview some of the writers that are featured in the Book of the Month boxes, offer you some authorly anecdotes, and get you extra pumped for each and every month. You can go to virtualbooktour.com to learn more about it and listen to it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I'll link everything down below. Without further ado, let's take a peek at this month's selection. We have The Lifestyle by Taylor Hahn. A married woman lives in New York City and she comes up with a five-year plan to save her marriage. A Woman of Life by Kali Fajardo Anstey, which is a literary fiction that highlights three generations of women in the 30s in the American West. Look at the colors. Oh, the Stardust Thief by Chelsea Abdullah. This is the author's debut fantasy. It has dark magic and a dangerous quest inside. And there's also two thrillers to choose from this month and I can't decide which one to read first. But first one is The Lies I Tell by Julie Clark, which is a domestic thriller, which is one of my favorite types of thrillers. It's a cat and mouse story of two women. I'm so intrigued. And last but not least, Things We Do in the Dark by Jennifer Hiller. Just listen to the synopsis. When Paris Peralta is arrested in her own bathroom covered in blood, holding a straight razor, her celebrity husband dead in the bathtub behind her, she knows she'll be charged with murder. You think, girl? If I had to choose, I think this one would be it. But you can make your own choice by clicking the link in the description box below. Use the code Allison Pages to get your first book from Book of the Month for $9.99. Thank you, Book of the Month, for sponsoring today's video. Let's discuss what I read in the month of May. So first things first, I would like to start this video with some disclaimers. The first one being is that it is my job to read books and talk about books online. So it is a general rule of thumb to not compare yourself to others online, but especially don't compare how much you read or what your bookshelf looks like, etc., to booktubers. If you've read three books this month, that's great. If you've only gotten around to one, that's still more than most people. If you didn't get to reading anything this month, that's also okay. The great thing about books is that they're always there for you when you feel ready to read them. The second is to check the trigger warnings for any and all books that may pique your interest if you have any sensitivities. There's no shame in that. Storygraph usually has some pretty comprehensive lists and also there's doesthedogdie.com. And the final one is that we are all different human beings with a whole wide range of experiences. So if I hate a book that you loved or if I loved a book that you hate, that's totally fine. I'm an insignificant person on the internet.com sharing my feelings about stories. It's not that deep. We all have different feelings towards books and they're all good and great and fine and wonderful. Part of what makes talking about books so fun is that we all have different takes on them. Read whatever you want, read at your own pace, do your own thing. So without further ado, let's just jump into it. The first book I read in May was Odd Girl Out, An Autistic Woman in a Neurotypical World by Laura James. So this is a nonfiction honest account of Laura's experience within the first year after receiving her autism diagnosis, which she doesn't get until well into her adult life. It follows all of her reflections and realizations that unfold immediately after receiving such a life changing piece of news. I've seen some critiques online that say that this book would have been better if she had waited to release such a book until she understood herself more, until she understood autism better, etc. But honestly, I found it extremely raw, real, and relatable to those fresh feelings that sprout when you come face to face with something that sure makes a lot of sense, but is still a big pill to swallow. She's given this new perspective on every experience she's ever had. And seeing as she's an adult, she literally has a lifetime of happenings to dissect through this new lens. I personally find it equally helpful and important to hear stories from people seasoned with experience and cognizance of their feelings, but also the earlier stages of processing. I think that's also very crucial to illustrate, especially if you yourself are experiencing similar questions or similar troubles in facing all of this newness. It can make you feel a lot more normal and less alone, which is wonderful. And so I thought this book was nice and fresh and important, and I'd like to thank Laura James for writing it. 
Next, The Five Wounds by Kirsten Valdes Quaid. This is a literary contemporary character study that follows the lives of Amadeo, an absent father, Angel, his teenage daughter, and Yolanda, Angel's grandmother slash Amadeo's mother. When we start this book, Amadeo is living with Yolanda and is grappling with alcoholism when his teenage daughter shows up at his front door, 16 and pregnant. Together, they're all trying to navigate the turbulent waters of life. Amadeo is trying to become an independent and reliable rock for his loved ones, but struggles with consistency. Angel's working hard to get her degree and grasp the concept of motherhood alongside other teen moms. Yolanda is trying to be the glue for the family while grappling with and keeping secret a new life-threatening diagnosis. This is one of those books where not a lot happens plot-wise, but so much is unfolding as far as character development is concerned. I genuinely think that this is the most human book I've ever read, which is not easy to do. And I think I'm also gonna say that this book is my favorite character study of all time ever. Everybody was just so perfectly and understandably flawed, and I cared about every word on the pages. Definitely one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. I'm gonna read the quote that made me want to pick up this book. Angel had sort of believed that death, the death of someone essential and life-defining meant the end of everything. But here she is, mashing banana with a fork, loading the dishwasher. Here she is, having placed Connor in his pen, doing something as mundane and necessary as choosing from among the bottles lined up along the edge of the bathtub and shampooing her hair. This heartache is much larger than anything she's felt. It's agony. She can't sit still. It hurts so much. And also enlivening. Angel had no idea that the world could hold ache like this, just as before Connor was born. She had no idea it could hold such love. This was our pocket pages read for May, and I'm so happy that we wrote it together because oh it was just so good and I'm glad I didn't read it alone. If you'd like to join us for June the link is down below. We're reading Almond. We read a book every month in the first three weeks and then discuss in a temporary discord server in the last week of the month to accommodate for the many time zones that we're all from so you don't have to be available for any live stream and there's no way to miss out on the discussion. <laughs> I'm sorry if you see me looking at my notes. My brain is not functioning today. <laughs> Cast, The Origin of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. Isabel Wilkerson is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and her talents shine through every single sentence in this book. It's a nonfiction that identifies and illustrates the racial hierarchy in the United States and also in the Western world, how alive and well it is and calls it what it is, a caste system. She uses poignant examples and powerful prose to show this ever-present yet invisible ranking system that influences our everyday lives. This one is so well written and easy to read, not as far as the subject matter is concerned, but more so it is just excessively written. Even if you're not a big nonfiction reader, I think that you could get into this one, and I think you should get into this one. Her points are clear, and the eight pillars that she defines as the backbone for said caste system are concisely laid out. This book just packs a punch and is filled with crucial information that is often missed in our public education system, but nonetheless needs to be known and understood. I occasionally say how I think a book should be incorporated as required reading in the high school public education system in the United States, but this is the book, this is the one that everyone should be reading, in my opinion. I couldn't possibly urge you to read this one more. It has precious real estate on my favorite shelf. That's how good it is. Oh, it's so good. So good. The next read was a buddy read, and it is She Who Became the Sun by Shelley Parker Chan. Now, as you may already know, I'm currently on the hunt for the ultimate woman-loving woman book, and it seemed only natural that this would be a part of that process, seeing as TikTok advertises this book with two simple yet strong words. Sapphic, Fisting. So I personally was immediately sold, and so I partnered up with my fellow bookish pal, What April Reads, to do a good old-fashioned buddy read, but we both ended up disappointed with this one in the end. I've heard from several sources that this is similar to The Poppy War, which is one of my favorite series of all time. And while I can kind of see the comparison, you know, we have a badass female protagonist who will do anything in order to survive and thrive. And the first part of this book, it's broken up into three, definitely felt Poppy War-esque. It was easy to follow, it was strongly written, and it flowed flawlessly. The Poppy parallels were there until the second and third part of the book. Those last two parts almost felt like they were written by a completely different author. They felt like completely different books. And while I can appreciate what the aim of this was, to incorporate historical events in a more fantasy space. April and I both felt that said elements weren't really seamlessly integrated in the story and were more so just clunkily incorporated. I was taking extensive notes to keep track of everything. I really was. I was trying my darndest and it didn't even help in the end, which is very disappointing. I was just endlessly confused and overwhelmed by this one. But my biggest qualm with this book, which I will discuss in the sapphic video in the future, doesn't have to do with the book itself, but more so the book community and bookstores things little like. And it has to do with said infamous sapphic fisting scene that everyone is talking about. We endured almost 400 pages of this book for a page and a half of semi-spice. A page and a half. Please somebody explain to me using simple terms why a mildly detailed sex scene between two women is deemed as too graphic to be young adult. While meanwhile, Colleen Hoover's heteros are consistently glazed in each other's juices like fresh crispy creams on an early morning after Sunday mass sitting on the YA shelf. Make it make sense. 
Next, one last stop by Casey McKista. This is the second standalone romance from the infamous author that brought us red, white, and royal blue. Within it, we follow August, who cynically moves to New York City, not believing in love or magic, but quickly finds it in the unlikely spaces of a subway. She lives in an apartment with multiple roommates, starts waitressing at an overnight diner, and her daily commute to work becomes an electrical experience. She meets a charming and attractive woman named Jane, looks forward to bumping into her anytime she has to take the train. Something about Jane is a little bit off. She not only appears to be, but is literally from the 1970s and is stuck in time and space on this subway, completely unaware of what her life was like before. I thought this was surprisingly well done. It had very complete characters. The roommates were just as likable as everyone claims them to be. I not only loved following the romance between these two women, but it was equally fun to try and detangle the sci-fi elements. And also I loved August's day to day. I loved the conversations with her friends. I just loved all of it. I thought it was so good. This one deserves all the hype it has. It puts such a funky little spin on your typical romance. If you've been considering picking this one up but I've been putting it off. Put it off no longer. Just go and have some fun. Also, who knew that subways could be such a spicy space? Not me. Next, The Grief Keeper by Alexandra Villasanti. This book follows a 17 year old named Marisol who always dreamed about being American and she and her younger sister Gabby flee their dangerous lives in El Salvador to seek asylum in the United States. As readers, we get the feeling that there is a crucial component to their story that is missing and later we find out that Marisol is gay, which put her and her loved ones in a precarious situation in their home country. However, when she and her sister are informed at the detention center that their asylum request will most likely be denied, Marisol accepts a strange opportunity in order to keep her and Gabby safe. She's asked to become a grief keeper which means that the trauma of another person will be put into her body, that the symptoms of PTSD from the other person will be relieved and will be put inside of her instead. I am genuinely so shocked that I have not heard anything about this book. I think it deserves so much more hype. It encapsulates very important representation of immigrating to the United States, what it takes to cross the border, sacrifices you have to make to start a new life for yourself. They have this great metaphor. On page 120, there's a conversation that she's having with her sister and Gabby's reminding her of this person that they knew that had to carry a package over the border. She said, I I think it's like when Senora Flores wanted to send her son to America but didn't have enough money. So the coyotes told her that if he carried a package with him, they would charge him less. It's obvious you have to carry something for someone else so you can be in America. Oh, it's also very unique with these subtle sci-fi aspects of healthcare being so advanced that trauma can be transferred between two people. And also sapphic books are so hard to come by. Books with lesbian protagonists are few and far between, let alone one that carries such important themes. I think this is a book that you will love if you loved Nina LaCour's Watch Over Me. Trauma and grief are just so well handled in these pages and the theme of less privileged people having to bear the weight of more privileged populations is spot on. But overall, I'm just shocked that this book feels slept on and I wish more people were reading it and talking about it because it's so well done. Yeah. Next, A Certain Hunger by Chelsea G. Summers. This is a super popular unhinged woman book that I'm just seeing all over the place. And this is another one that I think deserves the hype that it has. This is a literary fiction, meaning that it doesn't follow your typical story arc, but it also doesn't follow your typical characters either. Our protagonist, Dorothy Daniels, is a high-end food critic and is a master of the culinary arts. So in a sea of vivid food descriptions and equally graphic sex scenes, we're gifted with highly detailed accounts of the men she's murdered, which body parts she consumed from said men, um, how she prepares said body body parts which take us full circle back into technically food descriptions. This is the kind of book that I couldn't just sit down and read in one sitting despite the fact that I would like to, despite the fact that it's on the shorter side. This just felt more like a book that you needed to savor. Much like Dorothy savoring the organs of the men who unfortunately crossed her path. I just thought it was written so well. It was really impressive. It blew me away. Each meticulously crafted sentence just left me hungry for more and I just got lost in the life of this character. This is a book that I would highly recommend if you're not easily squeamish and you're looking for something different because it's so good and it's so unlike other books and it's so good. Next, Book Lovers by Emily Henry. This is the third book from Emily Henry, who's very well known for her other two romance books, Beach Read and The People We Meet on Vacation. The three of these books are just known for being a simple, cute time. This is the first Emily Henry book that I have read. Some of you told me that apparently that's not the way to do things. Most of you seem to have preferred Beach Read or Vacation more, but this is just the way it went for me. To be honest, I didn't have the best time with this one. I certainly cannot join the Emily hype train yet. I really wanted to though, please believe me. I was so excited for this one. I wanted to be excited as everybody else, but I just can't Line. This book follows Nora, who's a workaholic and decides to go on a summer getaway with her sister to a small town and she bumps into a co-worker there that she has always gotten along with and enemies to lovers ensues. The thing with the sisterly getaway is that I didn't get the strong sibling connection that I came for and craved because they're hardly spending any time together. Nora's always with this guy, Charlie, and if I were on vacation with my sister and she was never around, I'd be pissed. At the beginning of the book, the sisters make this bucket list for their summer getaway, but the stakes don't exist to see said list through and 
until literally half of the book. Overall, the characters just fell flat for me, and so I couldn't care about the connections between any of them. And yeah, it was quirky and silly, I'll give it that. There were some times that made me smile, but in said quirkiness, it made every single character act and speak exactly the same. I just never felt the urge to pick this one up, and its length felt more like a chore than necessary to develop the storyline. It was okay for what it was, though. You know, it felt like a Hallmark movie or a cheesy romance show that you watch when you're homesick from work or school, and that has its place in the book world, in my opinion. So if you liked this one, I'm so happy for you. I think that that's great. I don't know if Emily Henry and I are just the most compatible as author and reader, which is fine. I'm still gonna give the people we've been on vacation a chance this summer because I don't wanna write her off as a whole. I simply don't. So which Emily Henry book was your favorite, or rather, what's your favorite romance read of all time in general so far? I think mine is Dating Dr. Dill. Next. On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden. Gay graphic novel alert. Gay graphic novel alert. Also, it's sci-fi and it's space and it's fun. Also, look at the color palette. Ah, this one was so good. Anyway, I'm getting too ahead of myself. This graphic novel follows her main character, Mia, who is a new job on a spaceship. Her fellow co-workers and crew are full and complete characters and their job is to restore and destroy human relics on different planets in different dimensions, etc. However, the main reason that Mia joined the ship is because she never got to say goodbye to her first love before she was sent off to a different dimension dimension, world, planet, etc. This one was fun. This one was powerful. The art of this book is quite literally out of this world. It was beautiful. It was touching. I cannot praise it enough. I love this one so much that I immediately went to my local indie graphic novel shop and picked up Spinning, Tilly Walden's graphic memoir. She's right there. I've had this on my online TBR forever and honestly, I realized that the reason that I've been putting off picking up Tilly Walden for so long is because deep down I knew that it would be this good and it would just unlock this void within me that could only be filled by owning every single thing that this author made. So, Tilly Walden also has a tarot deck that's in her art style. Like, I've got it bad, y'all. I've got it down bad. I know the graphic novels tend to be on the pricier side, but look at how long this one is. You really get your bang for your buck. I love learning about every character and following on their adventures. It's just so good. Next, Veronica Decides to Die by Paolo Coelho. Okay, so I read Paolo's most famous book, The Alchemist, a couple years back, and I loved it. So I was really looking forward to picking up this one. The premise is simple enough. A woman named Veronica decides that she no longer wants to keep living, but not necessarily because she's depressed. It's rather because she feels like she's done all that she can with her life, and that in growing old, things are only gonna get worse, kind of like she's lived out her prime, so to speak. My first impression of this concept was that it was going to do what Matt Haig wanted to do with The Midnight Library, but better, because The Alchemist really showed how pleasantly and effortlessly Paolo Coelho's storytelling is, but I just didn't enjoy this one. This may just be a me thing because Paolo has expressed that he has also been institutionalized for mental health. Perhaps it's a time difference, you know, different generations. He was institutionalized much earlier than I was. It could also be a country or cultural difference, but in my opinion, the narrative of this one where no one's really mentally ill, they're just misunderstood, is a little more harmful than helpful to me. I totally get how this could be a refreshing take to the all-encompassing typical misery that ensues and that we endure when it comes to mental health, but I just felt like it wasn't an accurate portrayal of mental illness and I think it handled the subject a bit too lightly. For example, one character was just using the facility because she didn't feel like facing the real world, which I think gives neurotypical people a really inaccurate understanding of what inpatient therapy is for. It kind of also has the storyline of love will fix you, which I think is so dangerous. And the twist at the end felt just a little bit cheap to me, but he does have a very thoughtful afterward that kind of provides some context around the perception surrounding mental health in Brazil during this time. For example, how people viewed you if you were an artist or literally did anything that was outside of the norm. They thought you were sick. And so I understand why this book went to the places that it did. I think it had decent enough reason and I do have to give him credit for that. It's just that this one just wasn't my thing personally. Next, Your Babuena by Nina LaCour. Okay, y'all, first of all, believe me when I say I love Nina LaCour. I love her. One of her books, Watch Over Me, is on my favorite shelf. So when her first adult fiction was announced to be released this year, it was literally my most anticipated book of 2022. So I was flying over the moon when I saw that Your Babuena was in my book of the month box last month. I was so excited for it. And yet somehow it was the only book I DNF'd this month. Ah. This is a multi-point of view story and we bounce between these two very different women and follow them until their lives cross. It sounds simple and pleasant enough. I don't fully understand what it was. There was just something that never clicked for me. I read well over half of it, but just from page one, I felt like I was constantly tripping over each and every sentence, trying to grab onto the storyline and could just never do so. I just couldn't get invested. It was like I was presented with this colorful garden of characters and storylines, but none of the plants had roots. And so everything just died immediately. So truly to my utmost 
surprised I DNF'd this one. I'm sorry. I'm so sad about it as well. But that being said, it really did feel like a me problem. There are so many people who loved this book, so if you were one of them or if you are intrigued to pick it up, do not let my DNFing dissuade you because I think Nina LaCour is a great author and if this book does it for you, that's amazing and I'm jealous. <laughs> And last but not least, Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. Melissa Broder is the author who wrote The Pisces, which I also have on my TBR right now. Kirstie and I are gonna read it together. I'm so excited. And this one we follow Rachel, who's a young 20 something with anorexia. And we are shown her very specific food rules and rituals and the pain and restriction that comes around such an obsession around caloric numbers. Part of her routine is treating herself to a frozen yogurt, but one day the usual counter boy is replaced by a woman who completely entrances Rachel. She's always overfilling Rachel's cup and encouraging toppings, sprinkles, hot fudge, the work. And before we know it, Rachel and Miriam become beautifully entangled in each other's lives. Now, much like Yerba Buena and not knowing why I didn't connect with it, I don't quite know what drugs were released in these pages because this one flowed for me so effortlessly. I loved this book. I thought it was unabashedly human, a little strange, but also relatable. I haven't always had a healthy relationship with food and calories, and I felt like this book handled that relationship quite well and accurately. I've heard that it bothers some people that this is used as a plot point in the story, but it didn't feel like it was being used more so than it was being represented. Represented, and I personally like when things are represented in books and I don't think that caloric obsession was thrown in there for the fuck of it Me it felt like Rachel was a complete character and this was a component to her and I felt seen My only real qualm with it was that the ending felt a little bit rushed But it's a literary fiction so it wasn't like we needed a clean wrap up or anything We were just little flies on the walls during this slice of these women's lives So I would also like to say that if you've been putting this off because you feel like there are gonna be spicy scenes featuring food I don't know. Maybe that was just me, but when I read the synopsis, I thought there was gonna be this uh, graphic food kink in Involved, and that's just not the case. It was just a realistic mundane moment in time. We got some mommy issues We got a sprinkle of strange. So be careful with yourself when picking this one up Don't pick it up if the content warnings make you nervous because calories are mentioned quite frequently But if you still want to read it, I'd recommend it because I love the writing and I really cared about every single page so that's it. Those are the 12 books that I read in the month of May. My classes end this week, which means that there will be many books read in June and so many read this summer. I cannot wait for all of the reading plans that I have for myself. What was your favorite book that you read last month? Mine is definitely Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. It's the only book in the stack that now is on my favorite shelf, but honestly, Close Runner Up is On Assembly by Tilly Walden. Please read those books. Please read those books. But I wanna know your favorites because I love talking about books, if that wasn't clear already. Thank you once again to Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video. All the links are down below. Use the code Allison Pages to get your first book for $9.99. And also, thank you to everyone on Patreon who make it possible for me to upload as frequently as I do. I hope you're happy. Thank you for clicking. Thank you for caring. And thank you for being nice. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.